Hello, and welcome to Live with the 19th. I'm Amanda Zamora, co-founder and publisher of the 19th, an independent nonprofit newsroom that aims to empower you with the information, resources, and community you need to be equal participants in our democracy. Breast cancer is the most prominent type of dangerous cancer affecting U.S. women. One in eight will develop it in their lifetimes. And while death rates have gone down since the late 1990s, increased screening and better treatments are not accessible to everyone. For Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we're gathering medical experts at the forefront of the fight against cancers that primarily impact women and LGBTQ people. Today, you'll also hear from two survivors about navigating the medical system and life after treatment. Before we get started, we'd like to thank our founding sponsor, Pfizer, for making today's event possible. Here to share a few words is Diego Sacristan, Senior Vice President and U.S. Oncology Lead. Hi, everyone. I'm Diego Sacristan, and I am Pfizer's U.S. Oncology Lead. As we all know, breast cancer knows no boundaries and does not discriminate. Great progress has been made in this treatment. However, there is still a lot of work to be done, specifically when we look at the underserved and hard to reach communities who too often experience critical gaps in their care. At Pfizer, we're working hard to remove these barriers that impede people from accessing timely and affordable treatment options. Because we know that equity is only achieved when breakthroughs are available to all. I'd like to share a video featuring my colleague, Katrina Johnson, Director of Advocacy and Professional Relationships for Pfizer Oncology. And she's a true inspiration to many of us. Let's hear about Katrina's story. So rolling? Yes. We're rolling, okay. My name is Katrina Johnson. I'm a mom, daughter, sister, dog mom. I'm a Texas girl, yogi. In my spare time, I take care of my kids. I'm just kidding. That's what I do all the time. I'm a breast cancer patient advocate, and I'm also a three-time breast cancer survivor. My first breast cancer diagnosis was in 2002. I was 28 years old. I was terrified. That's the first time I heard the three words, you have cancer. It changed everything. I felt like my body betrayed me when I found out that I was gonna have to go through chemotherapy. The biggest fear, it was will I ever have kids? Will I ever be able to be a mom? An oncologist really wanted me to get tested for the BRCA gene and it was positive. I had to decide for me. I decided to do the full mastectomy. To me. It was empowering to say, take all the breast tissue. I don't need that. I'd rather be here. I'd rather have a life and have, look, the life I have today. I would not be where I am if it weren't for my family, my community, my sisters, so many people who have supported me and gotten me through all of this. I am simply so grateful. I can't say that I'm glad that I had cancer, but what I can say is that I think it's shown me my strength. This started leading me into the advocacy work because I, I wanted to become more of an empowered patient. I wanted to understand more about the implications of BRCA1. We have to know our bodies and we have to advocate for ourselves. I don't have an active cancer diagnosis right now, but I still go to my oncologist every six months, dermatologist every three months. Schedule, schedule, I make sure I have all that. In addition to a full-time job, running my kids around, I put my care at the forefront of everything I do. I have to for Kaylin and Gavin so I can be here, so I can be their mom. I just want to soak every minute of it in. I don't want to miss anything. It's sad that we have to worry and wonder, will there be another diagnosis? Or will the next one be one that I can't recover from? But for today, I'm here. A quick reminder that while sponsors help keep the 19th event free for our readers and viewers to attend, they play no part in the programming of these conversations. Now, let's get into today's conversation, which we'd love for you to be a part of by using the hashtag the 19th live. First up, a conversation with several doctors at the forefront of the fight against breast cancer. We have Dr. Elizabeth Jaffe, a professor and the deputy director for translational research at the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Connie Lehman, a professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School and the founder and co-director of the Breast Imaging Research Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. And Dr. Funmi Olopade, a professor of medicine and human genetics 
and the founding director of the Center for Clinical Cancer Genetics and Global Health at the University of Chicago Medicine. Abby Johnston, the 19th editorial director, will lead this conversation. Abby? Thank you so much for speaking with me today. This is a critical conversation, and we're so glad that you're here to be a part of it. In the United States, one in eight women will develop breast cancer in her lifetime. Aside from lung cancer, it represents the deadliest form of cancer for U.S. women. There are thousands of families impacted by breast cancer, including mine and undoubtedly many of our viewers. And so during October, which marks the annual Breast Cancer Awareness Month, the 19th is asking the question, what are the developments that will help us end breast cancer and the many other types of cancer that disproportionately impact women and LGBTQ plus people? We've gathered an excellent panel here today to talk to us about the current state of breast cancer research, the barriers that still exist for detection and treatment, and the political will to help reduce or even end cancer-related deaths. Each of you have specific areas of expertise and study different facets that further breast cancer research and treatment. I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about your slice of this really vast world. And Dr. Lehman, I'd love to start with you. Absolutely. So I'm a radiologist, um, a physician scientist, really trying to understand better the signals and cues within every mammogram that a woman has and those cues and signals that can help us not only detect earlier, but actually predict future breast cancer events. And if we can predict future breast cancer events, we can do a lot to try to reduce the cancer from ever occurring, reduce that risk, um, and in the event that a woman is diagnosed with cancer, detect it early when it can be cured. Um, the, my recent work has really drilled down on the incredible power of artificial intelligence and deep learning to extract these signals to significantly empower our ability as radiologists to predict future events in a woman's life. Dr. Olapati, can you tell us a little bit about what you work on? First of all, thank you for inviting me to be part of this wonderful panel. Um, you know, I started off being a cancer geneticist, trying to understand genes that lead to aggressive progression of breast cancer. And now I've become what I will call a preventive oncologist, because what I want to really spend the next decade doing is implementing projects that would allow every woman to know their risk for breast cancer and then to personalize how we detect breast cancer so we can treat it when it's most curable. And so I talk about prevention and early detection of breast cancer. And then for those that we cannot really detect early that have started off as metastatic, uh, we really want to develop new drugs so that they, every woman, wherever they live in this world, would have access to accelerated access to clinical trials. Because we know that breast cancer is gonna be with us for a very long time. And the more we can do research to accelerate progress, uh, the better we're all gonna be. And so I really wanna do this at a global scale. So that's what I'm working on. Thank you so much. And Dr. Jaffe? Yes, I also wanna thank you for inviting me. This is very important as well from my point of view. Um, so I'm, I'm trained as a uh, oncologist, but I've spent most, most of my career really trying to understand how the immune system sees cancer. And I do this both in breast cancer and in uh, pancreatic cancer. I've been mentoring a number of early career faculty in breast cancer who are now uh, testing some novel approaches that combine um, immunotherapy with other um, uh, types of drugs such as um, uh, epigenetic regulators of the tumor microenvironment. And we've been trying to better understand what are the complex signals between tumor cells, the inflammation that comes into these cancer cells, as well as the regulation of tumor cells and their surrounding um, cellular compartments. Tumors we're learning, and breast cancers are no exception, are very complex, and they have many different normal cells that are actually co-opted by the cancer cells to help the cancer cell grow and metastasize. 
In addition, inflammation can be good and bad. So the immune system initially comes in reacting to the cancer, but then gets also co-opted by the cancer cells to help the cancer grow and metastasize. So we're finding that using many of the new molecular technologies that are currently available, where you can actually look at each single cell in a tumor and look at the 60,000 different uh, uh, expressed um, genes, as well as look at many different proteins at once on one cell and start to understand not only what that cell is doing to communicate with the surrounding environment, but also how um, that cell interacts with other cells, which ones they're closest to. We can look at on a slide and we can actually look at the different signals each cell is expressing on a slide. So knowing who's talking to who and with what kind of um, communication they're having. Is it to help the cancer grow? Is it to help the cancer? Is it to try to kill the cancer? And then we could develop drugs that are able to intercept these signals to make sure that the immune system is fighting against the cancer. So we've been uh, developing this both in, in preclinical models and um, more recently, we've been testing some of these approaches in patients. And we're, we're optimistic that we're starting to see um, some good results. Thank you all so much. I have a question for the whole group here. Uh, we've seen breast cancer mortality rates slowly declining, uh, but there are still tens of thousands of breast cancer deaths each year. What are the driving factors that keep this mortality as high as it is? And uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Lehman. Well, we know, as Dr. Olapati mentioned, that first, this is a global disease. We want to have solutions that impact all the women around the world that are at risk for breast cancer. We know that there are very um, strong trends. For example, when we detect breast cancer early, the, the chance of survival is so high. Um, we often say we'd rather treat a woman with early breast cancer than a woman with um, you know, intransient hypertension or many diseases that don't have the cancer label, but will have a much higher impact on our quality of life than an early um, breast cancer diagnosis. So um, when we can detect early, we can cure even better is when we can prevent the cancer from occurring. Um, and there's a lot of work being done now to identify and be more precise in which women will and will not benefit from prevention strategies and more aggressive early detection strategies. As a radiologist, I'm constantly advising women on, is a mammogram sufficient? Should they start at 40 or 50? Um, should they even start earlier? There are many subgroups of women where waiting till 40 is just not um, reasonable if we're really into targeted interventions and precision medicine. I also really want to point out the work we've been doing at Mass General that has unveiled some um, very concerning trends in access for our patients. When we started testing and studying our deep learning models to predict a woman's risk, I needed something to compare our deep learning models to. So we had a huge database at Mass General with traditional risk models that were built on European Caucasian women. And what we found was that these continue to favor white women, providing white women with access to more mm -hmm. intensive interventions for prevention and early detection compared to our patients identifying as Black, African-American, Hispanic, and Asian. It was really shocking. While I knew that there was this bias, I hadn't actually seen it in my own patient population, um, just how traumatic it was. At the level of, you know, we have white women who are two and a half to three times more likely to be granted access to risk-based interventions compared to our patients identifying as patients of color. And we did not see differences in their cancer rates. So that is a systemic challenge that we have to fix and we're eager to do that. Dr. Olapati, could you talk a little bit about the driving factors that are keeping this mortality rate high? Yeah, and that's exactly a good way to uh, follow up on what Connie has said. Uh, we have been trying to collaborate with uh, investigators in Boston, and we've tried to replicate the beautiful work you've done on artificial intelligence and deep learning. And, you know, I'm on the south side of Chicago. I don't have to go anywhere to see my neighbors uh, come in wanting to get uh, uh, treated at the University of Chicago. And if they don't have insurance, you know, I can't treat them. I, you know, if I go out and I drive my mammography machine out, I, you know, they can't come in. And that's 
totally unfair in the in in God's own country. This is the wealthiest country in the world. And so I'm excited to be able to actually ask those fundamental questions because when we have brought people in and they have had access to the same treatment, they have act, had access to clinical trials, they have been treated by doctors who know them, who understand them, who look like them, who eat like them and respect them, they have done well. And so every time I go at, out and people say, oh, well, Black women don't do this. I was like, no, if they come to our clinic and we ask them, they sign up for clinical trials. They participate. They encourage us to do genetics research. The problem has been the barriers we put in front of them to even get to us. So that's why I think the pandemic has showed us yes. we've got to blow up everything we're doing now and start afresh and start with the most vulnerable po population and personalize it for everybody, right? We're in this together. That's why we're talking about global solidarity. It's not about, you know, we've, we've made great gains and we've done all of these advances, but Americans, even Americans in, in rural communities are not benefiting. So let's not kid mm -hmm. ourselves, right? So that's why it's not about black or white. It's not about Hispanic or Asian. It's about all of us women working together to make sure that no one gets left behind. And so we've mm -hmm. picked up on what uh, uh, the Mass General Group has done and we've been advancing it and we are gonna develop our own model that actually is more inclusive because we have the data here and we're gonna collaborate. And that's why I really uh, enjoy this moment because women have come together, they have fund re funded research, uh, especially research in the Department of Defense. My first grant came from the Department of Defense and I went to do work in Nigeria. And now some of what I've learned in Nigeria, I'm bringing back to my community on the South side of Chicago. And I think that's why I see this as a global movement to end breast cancer as we know it, but we're not gonna get there unless we all come together. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Jaffe, what do you see as some of these, these barriers that we have in place and the driving forces of uh, high mortality rates? Well, both my colleagues are very eloquent and said it quite well, but I'll just add that I think um, that clearly the pandemic has just really uncovered all the problems and they're right in front of us. And I could not have said it better um, than Dr. Olapade that we have to just say, the system doesn't work. We have to reinvent the system. We have to be all inclusive. We have to get our um, screening opportunities out there to remotely, regardless of color. You know, there's a lot of socioeconomic issues. There's people who live in, in rural areas. They're just not getting the access. And I have to say our healthcare system is not exactly fair. Even, even though we do have the Affordable Care Act, it is not supported equally in every state. And it's not supported enough. We need to support it more. Patients need to have that ability to pay for these things. Because you see, even we can screen for colon cancer. We can screen for breast cancer. But what about the next steps? What if we find something? Does every every person who has something abnormal have the opportunity and this, the opportunity for access, but also the, the opportunity to pay for the next step? And so I, I think this is a real, a real issue. It's been fully unmasked with the pandemic. And if we, if we don't just take a step back and say, how are we really gonna address this in a new and big way? We'll never solve this. And everyone has to be at the table. We have to have government, we have to have um, healthcare systems, we have to have industry. Everybody has to be at the table willing to do this. And I think the time is right. I think I think there's enough here, as we just heard, you know, from both my colleagues. Women are ready to do this. Everybody is ready to do this. And I think we don't want to lose this opportunity. I, Liz, mm -hmm. I love how you say that. And when we studied um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, um, early, early on, we were asked because they were all around the country to stop screening mammography so we could appropriately use the resources at the height of the pandemic. And then we were asked to reopen and start screening again, most of us late May of 2022. So we had the upper of 2020. We had the opportunity 
to then say, you know, what's going to happen because of the pandemic to screening. Now, a lot of people were publishing their research and saying, don't worry, we recovered. We dropped down to zero, but in that first summer, we did all these great programs and we recovered our pre-pandemic volumes, but nobody was reporting on racial differences. And, and neighborhood differences and geocoding differences. And we, we looked and saw, well, our volumes recovered, but we shifted who we were screening. We were asked to screen our highest risk patients and we were screening our wealthiest white patients. That shift wasn't being presented and we published our research, but also the good news was we showed that by measuring it, you can change it. As soon as we saw how inequitable the recovery after the pandemic was was trending in that first year we really ramped up our programs and we completely corrected course by the second year so by the summer of 2022 we had exceeded our pre-pandemic volumes of our neighborhoods that were lower income our patients that identified as hispanic asian um, black african american so we can fix this but if we don't measure it we don't report it we don't own it we can't possibly start to change it yeah. Well, that's actually a fantastic segue. This entire conversation has been to my next question, which is for uh, for Dr. Olapade. We know that one of the most effective ways to prevent breast cancer, the most uh, effective way to prevent breast cancer deaths is through early detection. But we also know that people are falling through the cracks in that early detection. And so what can be done to lift some of the barriers for the most vulnerable populations? And who are those populations in the United States? Yeah, so you know, the meeting I, I was running for, for before coming to this panel was really looking at our data from 1992 when we started collecting data because you know I'm a, I I'm data driven because I do research and I look at the patterns of women who come to my clinic from my neighborhood, right? In this private hospital. And you can see that for my patients who are rich and wealthy, they'll find me. It doesn't matter where they live in Illinois, right? They will find me and they will come. And they were the first to start having genetic testing for BRCA1 and BRCA2. And they were the first to gain access to all the clinical trials, right? HER2 used to be the worst type of breast cancer you could have. And then we got Herceptin and HER2 positive breast cancer became the most treatable breast cancer. But guess what? The people who had her two positive breast cancer flew all over the country to come to get onto mm -hmm. my clinical trial because they had money, they had access. And the black women in Northwest Indiana who are just, you know, 15 miles away from me didn't have access to her two targeted therapy for another decade, right? So that's why, but when we look at the data and we watch and we see what has happened, so guess where the worst disparity at the University of Chicago was? It was between black and white women with HER2 positive breast cancer because mm. the wealthy, the white way women got access to clinical trials. We started using the treatment and they got on. And it took another decade before it became registered and was approved for general use. So this is why if you collect the data, you will see that broadening access so that people can have access to the best treatment as soon as it's available, not limiting it just to the academic elite medical centers is gonna help us get, not just come and screen for your breast cancer, screen and treat, because we now know that breast cancer is not one disease. You can't tell everybody, wait until you're 40 to get mammogram. Some women need to know about it before they're 30. You can't say, okay, you have breast cancer, go have mastectomy. We were finding women were still saying, just take my breast off, but I won't get chemo. When chemo was actually helping them and more and more people were getting chemo and surviving. So I think we got it wrong because for decades, we kept screening and saying, go and get your mammogram. And then of course we know mammogram, getting your mammogram alone is not sufficient. You've got to get it and you've got to immediately come in and get treated. So we find that this black women were having delays in getting in 
because if they don't have insurance, they first have to go and get insurance. They have to get, I, I agree with, uh, with Dr. Lehman about uh, uh, Affordable Care Act. So you have to register for it. You, I mean, there's so many barriers. So the system has not worked. And so what we are looking to do, especially in Chicago, all the academic centers are now thinking about how to promote breast health equity so when I started, black women in Chicago were twice as likely to die than white women. And now we're saying that's not acceptable. We all have to get into the community. We have to screen, detect early, and immediately navigate to excellent care, closer to home. They don't all have to come to the University of Chicago. They don't always have to come to Northwestern. They need to be home and there should be good quality care in their own communities. So that's what we're hoping will happen, where you're not just screening, you're screening and treating, and you're eliminating the barriers. Uh, because we knew that uh, ages ago that Black women in Harlem, unless you navigate them to care, they were just lost in the system. So I, I think there's a lot we can do. Can I add a point? You, you made me think of something really important. Um, I mean, all of this is very important, but. You know, today to navigate the healthcare system, you need either a PhD or an MD. It is so hard. And I think exactly right what you're saying, Fumi. It's, it is, we really need a better way. We can screen, but then the patients don't know what to do with that. And they're not told and nobody sets up the next appointment for them anymore. It's broken. It's broken. I, I totally agree. And we put a lot of programs in. To, we saw that we had... Um, inequity across races and ethnicities and the time from an abnormal screen to a diagnostic workup to a biopsy. We could measure that, see it's a problem and fix it. We had immediate read screens, same day diagnostics, changing the paradigm, changing the system so the biopsy was done then. A lot of people said they're not going to want to do that. It's going to upset them. It's going to be confusing. It's going to be too much incredible widespread acceptance. Of course, if they could be offered to go ahead and fix this. Now, most of the screens that we call back don't need a biopsy. So that was just that peace of mind and reassurance, but also right. capturing those that did and then looping them in. I really love it that we're all talking a story of we're taking ownership. There was just too much of this talk of they're not educated. They're not doing this. They're not compliant. Mm -hmm. When I see that in our suburban neighborhoods, how much easier it is in our wealthier suburban neighborhoods for women to go in for a Saturday screen, to have after hours evening um, appointments, to have nurse navigators that are calling them and guiding them through, and how much more challenging it is in some of our other neighborhoods that don't have the Saturday screens, don't have the evening appointments, don't have the same level of access. That's not them, it's us. And we've got to, as you said, Liz, we, and, and um, Fumi as well, we've got to just, you know, the pandemic has sort of broken everything down, which is great. We've got to rebuild from that um, better systems for all our patients. I mean, Dr. Jaffe, you said that you need a PhD or an MD to be able to navigate the healthcare system. Even for someone, you know, I have a lot of flexibility in my schedule. I have health insurance. I am at high risk for breast cancer and navigating what is covered for me when I'm supposed to get a mammogram, all of this stuff has been impossible uh, or felt like it was impossible. And that's for someone with a lot of privilege and being able to navigate systems. Um, and so the barriers that are up for so many people are just insurmountable. I, I um, just had one other thing. We did a very, a, a very important analysis of our patient population, East Baltimore and Patients are coming for, for therapy, but they're not willing to stay on for clinical trials. And some of the things we learned is that many of them don't have transportation. And I think this goes with even screening and with the follow-ups. We're, we're taking that this for granted that it's easy to get transportation to get this done. They don't even have transportation. So, or they don't have caregivers for the family member who's sick or the young child at home because they're working two or three jobs. So I, I think we have to really be thinking about the whole person and not just that one little, as, as Connie said, you know, we're thinking about, you know, oh, the patient was just not compliant. No, that's rarely the issue in my mind. It's these other factors that we don't even consider. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that we've learned, um, you know, the American Cancer Society asked me to write about disparities 
And then, you know, we, we published this paper in 2015 and we realized that it could, you know, all our description of the root causes of disparities couldn't be farther from the truth because the truth was that we put women in a system where they couldn't thrive, even if they tried to, right? And so now after the pandemic, everyone is talking about the racism in the biomedical research establishment, the redlining that allowed Chicago to be segregated. And yet for decades, you know, our mantra was that it was their fault. And so now I'm really happy that we're all owning this, that yeah. it's a system issue. And that's why I really maintain that it's about solidarity, that all of us stakeholders and all of us, uh, you know, I'm, we're speaking about breast cancer. So I'm talking about, you know, persons who get breast cancer. It doesn't matter where they are in the world. We have to do this in solidarity. The HIV epidemic was communicable. You could contact yeah. it and we all came together in solidarity. And I think this moment calls for solidarity with women everywhere so that we can begin to move the needle. So every woman has a chance to survive. Yes. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jaffe, this next question is for you. Um, immunotherapy has improved patient outcomes for some types of advanced breast cancer, but can you tell us about your work in immunology and the work you're doing to extend those outcomes to more patients? Yes, of course. Um, so, so immunotherapy has had a small role in breast cancer and, you know, certainly targeted therapies, hormonal therapies have had a, a greater a role. But I think looking at combining immunotherapies with these other agents is very important. And that's why I mentioned that we're noticing from some of the preclinical work we do and when we move it into patients, we see the same results that when you combine the two, there's often synergistic effects. And I think that's where for treatment, that's going to be important. But actually, when we're talking about screening, one of the areas that I've always been interested in, actually my first DOD grant many, many years ago, was in trying to get the immune system to see the earliest changes in the ductal cells in breast cancer. And you know, now, you know, when you do identify um, people at high risk, there aren't a lot of wonderful options. I mean, losing your breasts is an option, and women do that, of course, but wouldn't it be nice if we had an option where they didn't have to be physically altered? And so we're hoping that by working with people like um, Dr. Fumi, who is looking at genetics um, uh, and people who are at high risk, you can identify these individuals and start to begin to look at what can we target with the immune system that's an earliest change. Um, in those uh, ductal cells. And I think now with all the new technologies, we're starting to be able to, you know, even with small biopsies from these pre-malignant lesions, identify the earliest signals. And um, I suspect we will be able to begin to think about using the immune system in higher risk populations instead of waiting until it's way too late. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you. And, uh, and it's really, really remarkable. And, you know, I talk about reverse innovation and the fact that, you know, as soon as we got BRCA1 and we knew, okay, here's a high risk allele, at least let's find all those young women at right. risk of breast cancer. And we worked with synagogues, we worked with churches, we did the ethical, legal, and social implications. And we realized that we have a tool that can actually help people arm themselves so right. that if they have a higher than normal risk of getting breast cancer, they can do something about it. And that research was fueled by women, by mothers, by a community of committed researchers that said, if we have to do this work because we want the next generation to not have to go through what we went through. And so as mm -hmm. people were talking about doing bilateral mastectomy, the first thing I went to was to go to my colleagues in radiology. And I'm like, I have all these black women who have participated in our research and they're not gonna part with their breasts because <laughs> if it's not broken, they don't wanna fix it, right? right? <laughs> they're <laughs> healthy. They just want me to find a way to screen yeah. them. And so in 2004, we started using MRI and guess what? We found that we can detect 
breast cancer early. We can find the earliest changes by doing MRI. And now we take it for granted that it's standard of care. So now these women have options because you can get MRI. I'm excited. I talk about preventive oncology. I'm not treating breast cancer anymore. I'm going to be looking to work with Liz to get people's immune system you know, regulated. Maybe they can snuff off the cancer before it yeah. even ever starts. And now we need to do more genetic testing. Everybody needs to know what they are at risk for, when they are at risk for it. We can't wait till 40 to say, go and get your mammogram. Black women are going to get breast cancer before 30. Asian women, Hispanic women, all kinds of women get breast cancer before 40. So why are we waiting till 40? So I'm excited that we can rev up the immune system. So while uh, Connie is looking to use MRI to find the earliest cancers, I'm going to be giving them vaccines to prevent cancer. How about that? <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and also it's a great example of where we can identify, for example, with MRI, that that is a better screening tool for these high-risk patients. So that better than ultrasound by far. And in fact, if you are at um, high risk, you should be really talking to your doctor about having a mammogram and an MRI. But we firmly believe, I believe, that it's the vascular imaging component of MRI. Most people around the world have no access to quality breast MRI. Most women in the U.S. do not have access to quality breast MRI, but they could have access to contrast-enhanced mammography. And the contrast-enhanced mammography programs are showing extremely high performance compared to contrast-enhanced MRI, which makes complete sense. It's just looking at the vascular flow of these tumors in the breast, which shows up earlier than the changes we see on the mammogram. So these are areas where we can have, you know, my early research was for 20 years of breast MRI research, which I was very excited about, but very discouraged about how limited the access was. Contrast enhanced mammography in the next five years is going to change that story, and it's going to provide um, access to high quality, affordable vascular imaging to the diversity of women at, at risk. And, you know, while you even talk about imaging, I want to be excited about what we're talking about now, which is liquid biopsy and multi-analyte cancer detection that maybe we don't even, you know, I, I know we talk about women, you know, coming in and having their breast image. How about a simple blood test or a wearable device that finds cancer and then we've can intervene, right? There's just a lot of really innovative ideas that are transforming the field, but we need to study lots and lots of women. We've gone from doing things in our own little uh, hospitals to now aggregating data from everywhere, right? And that's why I really am excited about solidarity. And, and I think every uh, cancer organization is talking about the vast amount of data that we can collect on pa patients through the electronic health record, through the digital mammography, through the handheld ultrasound. I know uh, Dr. Lehman loves the uh, contrast uh, uh, um, mammography, but how about even you know devices that can be on your wrist and will detect cancer? That's a wave of the future. And I don't think we're there yet, but we're going there. And I think when we get there, we would look back at this moment and say, why were we so backwards in how we did things? <laughs> but we have to do the experiments. We have to do the research and we have to do it in solidarity. While we're on the topic of these kind of innovat innovations and how we're detecting breast cancer, Dr. Lehman, your company, uh, Clarity, uses artificial intelligence to take a mammogram that could come back normal seeming and use it to predict if someone is high risk for developing cancer in the next five years. Can you tell us a little more about Clarity and where it is in terms of rollout? Sure. So what we um, are working on and in the in the area of computer vision, the vast majority of groups are focused on 
um, detecting cancer on the current mammogram. So humans have a lot of variation in how well they can see a cancer on a mammogram and identify normal versus abnormal findings. And so most people are trying to use computers to help radiologists not miss a cancer so that everyone can be an expert when they're reading the mammograms. And this was a lot of my research over the last 20 years showing that unfortunately the human variation of radiologists in interpreting a mammogram translates right over to human variation of radiologists in knowing to attend or not attend to a computer flagged lesion. So what we showed was that while in reader studies, there's a lot of early excitement that these CAD products were really gonna help radiologists all be terrific at reading mammograms, it just didn't roll out into community practice that way. So we, when we did careful studies, we found that it wasn't having the impact that we thought. So I didn't wanna repeat those um, errors of the past with the new level we had with techniques and tools and deep learning and artificial intelligence and thought, what if we use the power of deep learning to do something with the mammogram that the human eye and the human brain can't do? And that's not, find calcifications, find a subtle little um, speculated mass. It's actually to detect those patterns that are associated with a woman who's highly likely to develop cancer in the future five years. Not, not someone with a lesion now, but in the future five years. And the reason why I was so excited about this is we had seen in our practice, I thought it was always so interesting when we did our screening MRI programs and we studied those patients, not just the patients with the BRCA mutations that had such a high rate of cancer, but those with BRCA mutations that never developed breast cancer. I was so interested in looking at the different patterns on the MRI of their tissue and of the vascular imaging of that tissue, which seemed different and was really intrigued when we had patients that were at increased risk that went on chemo prevention and all the lights went out on the MRI. But in some women, it was, they stayed on. So I thought, how can we leverage the power of signals that we're not using as human radiologists to do more um, with, with AI and keep it away from a radiologist need to interpret that feedback from the computer. So um, we're very excited. We've um, a lot of this research I um, did previously was with colleagues at MIT. We have a research um, a risk tool that we have implemented at Mass General. We've been studying that very carefully. We did external validation around the globe of that, but we're moving in a new direction with the company to really try to have a commercial product out globally to patients, accessible to patients, using some different techniques and much larger databases from around the world to build the models and test them. And just a follow up to that, Dr. Lehman, we know that there are still people who are not getting annual breast cancer screenings. That's something that we've talked about a lot, or they don't have proper follow up. Uh, they don't have access to even get proper follow up. Um, so what are you hoping that technology like Clarity and artificial intelligence and deep learning can do to help change that? Well, you know, in the in the topic of artificial intelligence, you will always have a radiologist in the audience say, will I be replaced? I have some of our fellows that come to Mass General want to keep up their skills in ER um, imaging because they're like, if there's going to be anyone replaced, it'll be the mammographers because of all the work being done to have computers read a mammogram better than a human. Um, I, I really don't think that we are going to see in any way radiologists replaced by computers, but there are there are specific tasks that I do as a mammographer that should be replaced by a computer. So for me to screen through a thousand mammograms looking for five cancers, I will gladly have a computer do that better, do it more efficiently, more accurately, and take that technology and make it globally accessible. Because we have mammo units all around the globe, but we don't have subspecialized radiologists to read those mammograms. And I think we're really going to leverage the power of AI at one far end of the spectrum to replace radiologists in doing tasks that are better done by a computer than a human. And at the other end, we're going to leverage the power of AI to do um, and have tasks fulfilled off of images that we can't possibly do as a human. Um, and then somewhere in the middle is where most of the research is being done now is how to have a computer help a radiologist do the task that they've always been doing just a little bit better. And I, I think that middle ground is where most of the attention is. I'm much more interested in the two um, other areas um, in, in our future. And I think it's gonna have a dramatic impact on the field in the next five years. Yeah, maybe I can uh, pile on to that yeah. question about uh, AI and who is going to be replaced in medicine. I hope we can get 
doctors to still have jobs because <laughs> cancer patients do love talking to their doctors and having people support them. But doctors are overwhelmed and they can't be present. And that's why all of us are stressed. And the problem we have in medicine is not that we have too many patients that are looking to come to us is that we don't have enough doctors. So I hope your mammographers stay and they feel yeah. like they have a job and they have a future because what has happened is that we have concentrated resources in the most expensive way by having doctors where money is, right? And we've neglected vast majority of individuals who could use all of this technology, but don't have access to them. So I'm hoping that what we will do with image-based analysis, the same thing with pathology, there are places in the world where they can't even diagnose breast cancer, even if they wanted to, right? That we would begin to think about how we democratize access to care, where we do this in solidarity, where you can have point of care diagnosis, where it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can get your cancer diagnosed in record time. And then you can have a drone drop your drugs at your doorstep, right? So we all talk about, well, there's not going to be medical oncologists anymore. There's not going to be surgical oncologists because the idea is that we will make cancer become, breast cancer in particular, become a chronic disease, just like diabetes, just like any disease that somebody may have as they get older, and it doesn't matter what age exactly. they have it, they're going to survive and they're going to thrive. And if they need to take a pill for 10 years or 20 years, so be it. But we will diagnose it early and we will have effective drugs that they can take. So it becomes a chronic disease. So that's why I'm hopeful that we will have more and more people join us to be cancer doctors, whether they're imagers, whether they're immunologists, and then we will have a vast team of community health workers. We will have people who can support our patients in their own homes so they can survive and thrive and go back to work, right? That's what we want to see happen. I'm optimistic. Dr. Jaffe, <laughs> just because we only have a couple of minutes left, um, I'd, I'd love to hear all of your perspectives on this as well. Um, but Dr. Jaffe, you sat on the blue ribbon panel that advised Joe Biden's cancer moonshot initiative when he was vice president, and you're now chair of the president's cancer panel. One of the stated goals behind this reignited moonshot is to reduce cancer death rates by 50% in 25 years. How does having the backing of a presidential administration change the feasibility of these efforts? You know, that's a wonderful question. I also want to um, acknowledge that Fumi was part of that team, I believe, as well, our Blue Ribbon panel uh, group. Um, we had a, a wonderful group of very smart um, scientists, clinicians, and um, even patient advocates who helped uh, think about this. So, you know, I, I think what, you know, the White House, um, ha having, you know, a champion, and that's, that's what um, our president is, as well as uh, Dr. Biden, they're both champions for cancer research, for cancer care. And they're thinking about this globally. They're not thinking about this from the point of view of just cancer research. They're not thinking about just new drugs. They're thinking about reducing the cost of drugs. They're thinking about access, everything we've talked about here. And so this isn't um, one problem. This is multifaceted problem um, that requires policy change. It requires, so for instance, we've all mentioned we should have community work workers. Well, who's going to educate them and pay them, right? We need to come up with processes, ability to do that. We have to convince CMS to pay for these navigators who we're going to train. We should think about public health um, type of systems where, you know, why should we pay for medical school $50,000 a year, which is where what it, it currently is. So how is someone who doesn't have that money go to medical school today, someone who wants to go back to their community to really take care of those patients? If, if I'm going to go to medical school and someone's going to pay for it, then I'll give back a certain number of years to work in an under, you know, um, underserved area. That's what we should be doing. We should make this um, a system. We should think about systems that really address all these issues. So what can the White House do? What can a president who's really, you know, wants to see this happen? This is what he can do. He can 
make sure that we have policy change, that we change systems. He's already been able to get into play an act that will reduce the cost of some drugs. It's a start. It's not, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. But the success of that will result in more successes. It's sort of like the Affordable Care Act. Initially, there was a lot of you know, issues um, among different groups. You know, my doctor is not going to be the same. I'm not going to have the same care. Well, what happened once the Affordable Care Act um, was passed, is that the majority of Americans love it. They love it. That's why Republicans can't, you know, get it, <laughs> you know, um, you know, eradicated. The problem is, though, that we still have systems where each state decides how much money goes into it. And that's a huge issue. So we need a champion like the president to make all these, you know, cases known to the public, to help change policy, to help change health care policy to help change educational policy. This is what we need. It's it's a multifaceted problem and it takes all of us, like what's been said today by Connie and Flumate. We all have to work together. And you know what? I think women are the ones who get this done, right? Women know how to do this better than anybody because we care about people. We care about our kids. We care about our future. So we all have to work together and make this happen. Well, I believe that we are right at time. I thank you so much to all three of you for joining me here today. Uh, you know, like I said at the top, breast cancer has impacted so many people and families. And I know hearing what's on the horizon in terms of research and all the extremely innovative uh, ways that you're coming at this and the dedication with which you're coming at this it offers a lot of hope. So thank you for all that you do. And I hope that you enjoyed uh, speaking with me today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Now, let's hear about the patient perspective. Joining us today are Karen E. Jackson, the founder and CEO of the Sisters Network, an organization for Black breast cancer survivors. Karen is a four-time breast cancer survivor herself. And Alexandria Glorioso, a health journalist and the founder and CEO of Bard Owl Press a website that covers the healthcare system and its impact on patients. She's also a breast cancer survivor. Karen Hawkins, story editor at the 19th, will moderate this conversation. Karen? Well, hello, amazing panel. Thank you both for being with us today. I am so excited to hear from you and your insights and your wisdom. And so we don't have very much time together, so I'm gonna jump right into it. Um, in addition to being survivors, you are both founders. So if you can talk a little bit about the organizations that you started, why they're important and why they're important to you. And Karen, we'll start with you. Okay, I was thinking about the other Karen, so already. <laughs> anyway, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm very uh, appreciative to be on today. Uh, it is uh, my... Uh, feelings and my well wishes for everyone who's had the had the problem of breast cancer that they at least have the help from organized groups such as Sisters Network because we can open the doors and give the direction and the sisterhood we all need when having an early diagnosis. Wonderful, thank you. Alexandra, how about you? Hi, yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really um, appreciative of being part of this conversation and to have you know, the perspective of the patient in the conversation. And that is actually why I started my company, Bard Out Press. I had been a healthcare reporter for several years, but I felt like I was mostly writing about healthcare from the point of view of industry and from politicians and business executives who were in the medical system. And I just didn't think that my reporting was doing all that it could do. And I wanted to create a platform that would write stories specifically from the patient's perspective and, um, you know, we have published a few other essays by patients who go through the medical system. So everything on Bardell Press is first person, um, you know, either per first person personal essays or first person breaking news. And the goal is to eventually empower patients by educating them, telling them news and information about the medical system that 
is directly relevant to them so that they can become better advocates themselves once they eventually enter the medical system. Thank you. You know, that is a perfect segue to one of my questions about, so what can people do, not just breast cancer survivors, but anyone um, in the medical system who finds themselves with a chronic illness, perhaps, what can they do to advocate themselves kind of in practice? What does that look like when interacting with the medical system? As a national organization for Black women, because we have been in, in the existence for close to 30 years and having boots on the ground and uh, a number of cities across the country, we have found that education for everyone, that includes the survivor, the family, anyone that's associated with that particular patient needs to know what's available because the more you know, the longer and better your journey will be. So we would say education is the key and also join representation that looks like you, that's advocating for you. So you can learn the information direct and have some insight on what's going on in the uh, health uh, community. Thank you, Alexandra, how about you? I full heartedly agree. I think that having patient organizations is really important. I see Bardell Press as kind of like sitting in between an organization like Karen's and, you know, more mainstream media like I used to write for because, or and I still write for sometimes, but as t in terms of my own company, I think that we are filling an advocacy position, but it's really with very intimate personal information that people experience when going through the medical system. And I hope that when people read our stories and they relate to them and connect with us on social media, um, and connect with other patients that they will realize that they do have some modicum of power, even though that they, they are at a disadvantage in the medical system because they're sick and they're vulnerable and because they don't have, you know, a medical degree or a PhD in biology or oncology. So they're of course going to be at a disadvantage and they're just one person. But, you know, I think that Karen and I, are similar in that we hope that by creating, you know, more of a foundation for patients so that they know they're not alone, so that they know there are other people out there going through what they're going through, they will be able to speak up and advocate for themselves in real time. It's kind of vague, but I see it as something like, well, hold on, doctor, I didn't understand that. And I read on Twitter that other patients also don't understand this. So will you please explain it to me, you know, or let me write this down so that I can follow up with you later. You know, there's a lot that people can do just by asking questions and gently pushing back and, you know, following up about their you know, course of treatment, which isn't stuck in stone. I mean, they can make modifications along the way. And what I've found is that most patients are so overwhelmed and they view the medical system as kind of like this God-like figure that they don't question. And that's a lot of the time in my experience where they start to get into peril. Well, you are absolutely right, because um, without the education or knowledge of where to go and what to expect, you miss out on some of the opportunities that are available. And if you're not told what treatment is best for you at first hand, and if you haven't heard what treatment is recommended with a second opinion, which is essential for all of us to always try to get a second opinion, and that's outside the network that you are getting your first opinion from. I want to make that clear because sometimes we make the mistake and have your doctor recommend a person for your second opinion. I think you're better off finding a second opinion on your own. Oh, thank you for that. So I think in the healthcare setting, we hear a lot about patient-centered healthcare, and it's kind of what you're both describing, but it's proactive on the patient's part to advocate for ourselves. What would patient-centered care look like? Alexandra, if you can go ahead and start. 
Well, I think that patient-centered care has to start with patients owning their own medical information. It has to be fungible. Like patients have to be able to go to the hospital, get a test, leave with that test, have it somewhere that they can easily access and then give to another doctor. I really believe that until we make patient data fungible and give them ownership over it, it will be really hard for them to get the best care that they can get. And I don't think that they will ever have patient-centered healthcare if we don't do that first and foremost. I mean, the the whole medical system is paternalistic. And so at the, outs on, at the outset, doctors and other providers, other nurses and people in the medical system kind of assume that patients don't know anything and they need to be told what to do. And if they don't exactly follow the directions, then they're being a difficult patient and they get kind of dismissed. But a patient-centered program would not be paternalistic. It would empower patients to get educated, find the most affordable, you know, most convenient, best place that they can get treatment, and to really take ownership of what that looks like. And I just don't think that our system is really set up in any way, shape, or form to allow that. And that's why, you know, I went in the direction that I did professionally. Well, I'd like to add that uh, after 30 years, I have seen some small improvements that has made it a little more accessible, but it truly has a long ways to go. A patient navigator that some of the centers have now is uh, available, but the question is, if you don't know to ask for a patient navigator, it doesn't happen unless you request that. So like I said earlier, your knowledge of the system is your best advocacy for yourself. And for anyone who has not been diagnosed, your knowledge about just what, what centers are available, all are not equal. You need to understand that. What doctor, what hospital you select has a great uh, deal with how you handle your journey of breast cancer. I think one of the things you're both talking about is how personal this journey is for everyone. And I think this recognition that there, of course, can't be a one size fits all solution for any medical issue, but particularly this one. So what can healthcare organizations and medical providers do to provide more culturally competent care, particularly for folks of color and LGBTQ plus people? Well, you know, uh, we have found, uh, because currently, Black breast cancer is at a crisis, and the narrative that the media plays is not coming on as presenting Black breast cancer as a crisis. So they, we need to change that narrative so people will wake up and understand that if you're not up to date on what's going on in your health, you are at risk. So you are at a crisis in the Black breast cancer and we as an organization, we approach it in that manner. And if the media would start thinking in terms of where we are and not where we used to be or where we should be, we're now at a Black breast cancer crisis. You know, Alexandra, before you answer, Karen, can I follow up with you just for a moment? Um, what puts us at risk? Why, why is this a crisis for us? Well, first and foremost, um, we as a community, we get the breast cancer earlier. It's um, most likely that you may get triple negative, not necessarily, but triple negative is a type of breast cancer. Most of us don't know that they're different types, so therefore education is important. But if you happen to be diagnosed with one of the more aggressive cancers like triple negative, you don't have time to ponder and rethink, you need to go into an action mode so that it doesn't spread before it's past early detection. Because a lot of people don't understand early detection in breast cancer gives you the best survival rate. And now, unfortunately, the medical community still thinks that we're looking and being, that we're happy with five years survival. Well, you know, that narrative definitely has to change. I'm not interested in spreading the word for somebody to think they only have five more years. We're looking for a cure 
So that narrative is, is a crisis and we want a cure. Thank you, Alexander, go ahead, thank you. I really see the medical system as a microcosm for society in the sense that, you know, it touches on so many aspects of our life. Like our doctors, you know, sign off on our medical leave when we get sick and they get, you know, special extensions for that if we need it. They really sign off on us as wage earners in the country. And so I think that you know, already it's a system of control. I mean, it's a paternalistic system, as I said. It's a system where people are put in authority over the patients. And I think that, you know, if that is where you start and then most of your doctors are white men, there's just going to be bias everywhere and prejudice. And like, I felt like I really hit up against a lot of bias as a woman, because, I mean, especially because I'm in childbearing years and I had a really hard time getting, you know, straight on how risky it would be for me to have kids. And I felt like a lot of the male doctors who I worked with kind of dismissed my concerns about that. And, you know, it would be very risky to get cancer again, especially at my age, I'm 35 years old. And if I were to get, you know, cancer again, it would most likely be metastatic cancer. And as Karen said, the survival rate for metastatic breast cancer is on average five years. So I don't want to have a baby and then die and leave my husband a widower with this small baby. I'm just not interested in that. And so that was my experience with prejudice and societal bias. And I think about all the time, what if I were a person without an education? What if I were a person of color? What if I were a transgendered person? All of my problems that I've experienced in the medical system, and there are so many that I started an entire company about it, would be compounded. So I think that not only do we need transgender doctors and people of color who are doctors, not only nurse practitioners and, you know, we need people at the highest levels of authority in medicine to be representative of the population. But also, I really think that we need patients to have more power in hospitals. Like, why don't hospitals have patients on their boards? I mean, maybe they do, but I really feel like there are many tiny little bureaucratic problems that patients run into that could be solved if they were at the table, but we're not at the table. We're getting scraps from people and secondhand information. And, you know, even though we are these like extremely lucrative people for the medical system, they make so much money off of our bodies you know, we're really not treated in a humane way. And I think that for that to change, we need to have more power. We get power when we come together and unite the different causes and have one voice. Otherwise, singly, the fight is um, useless. You have to connect at all levels and have that one voice to speak to the issues that are concerning the breast cancer survivor. We're not there yet. Yeah, and I totally agree. And just to kind of like close that out, I think that, you know, organizations that recognize patients' problems recognize that there are shortcomings in the medical system. And when you talk to doctors and you talk to scientists, it's like you're talking to optimistic, hopeful people who are paid well for their time. And so everything from their perspective looks a little bit rosier. You know, a lot of the times like patients' deaths are like a footnote in research papers. And, you know, people talk around horrible side effects like, oh, we can get around that by managing it earlier. Like there's ways to brush our very legitimate concerns under the rug and make it look like this is no big deal. But when patients get together and I've seen it most powerfully on Twitter, but there's many social media platforms that patients use, you know, it becomes like a patient echo chamber. And then you realize, oh, this wasn't in my head. This was a real thing. And like, if there were any kind of infrastructure set up to address these problems, it would be addressed, but there's not. 
Well, some of the things that we're talking about, we sort of um, neglect to talk about the institutional racism that ex exists, is alive, and is doing well. And so until we start recognizing that the institutions have things set up that cause us to fail in the beginning, we have to address that situation uh, head on, that it exists and it shouldn't. I totally agree, 100%. And sexism too. Sexism. Well, we, we have a little short list too. <laughs> yeah, Sexless, sexism is doing maybe a little bit better, but <laughs> yes. they're both bad. All of the isms, yes. And <laughs> I don't know if um, you'll have read any of the 1619 Project, but one of the things that hit me the hardest about that project was this realization about Black women's pain, how medical students today are treated based on research from slavery that Black women don't experience pain, that Black bodies don't experience pain in the same way. Like just that, that pain is, that, you know, the treatment of pain is calibrated around that. So. Yes, and, and it is not. Yeah. And what is so infuriating about that is that like once you get into it, like I feel we all have, you realize that there is just discrimination and, you know, rose colored glasses in a certain way and little pain points that can be fixed. But when patients are not at the table and when patients aren't able to legitimately voice these concerns, it really never really reaches anybody who cares. Yes. You know, that's and that's why it doesn't change. And that's why the bias continues on. It's like this whole structure has been set up to make it seem like this holier than thou process that's saving our lives. When I feel like a lot of the time it's controlling us and discriminating against us. It also happens to save our lives. I mean, Karen and I are examples of survivorship. I don't want to say it's a useless system. I'm just saying that, you know, it has a long way to go before it's fair, equitable, and just. So what would you say to both the medical professionals that you interacted with personally, but also the industry as you think about it? Like, what are some of the things that you, now that you have this platform here today, what would you say to them? Well, I'm my first common would be that we need to make sure that including black breast cancer crises as, as a crisis and put it in the forefront where it should be because there's more women dying that look like me. There's more women being diagnosed. There's more women missing their diagnosis because they're waiting to age 40 because that's the stats that we're using. That's too late for African-American African -American women. So those things are institutionally set up and it may not just be for black women, but it definitely directly affects our going in to get the first baseline on what's going on in our bodies. Alexandra, I don't know if you have any other things, anything you'd like to add about what- I would just saying. say that the medical system is too greedy. I mean, they need to be open to tougher regulation. They need to stop selling our data anonymously for profit. I mean, really, we need to redesign this system so that patients, like Karen said, are at the forefront. And when patients are not at the forefront, then regular discrimination gets to seep in and decide who gets attention when and what order. But if every patient were empowered, if every patient could easily shop around for the scans that they could afford, you know, in places that were close by to their houses and then get treated somewhere else, for instance, where there's you know, more experts in their specific disease, they could save money and they would be a proactive member of the medical system. But it's really hard to shop around for your tests, even though hospitals act like patients don't want to. I have wanted to greatly in the past to shop around for my scans. And whenever I've, I have, I've run into like endless problems with my, you know, 
regular cancer center, the place where I go to see my doctors, not sending on those prescriptions until too close to my appointment so that I can't get them booked. And then I have to pay out of pocket for the scans. And then it's hard to get my records back from the organizations and take them back to my medical center. So the result of all this is that I pay thousands of dollars more for my scans every year. And it eats into my bottom line. My husband and I are both, um, we both have a health savings account because you know, we basically have a catastrophic healthcare plan. And this year we're going to blow through that health savings account, you know, and pay beyond it for our medical care, because I find it too difficult to shop around and save money in healthcare in ways that I know are actually harmless. Like I don't need to pay 600% markup to get an MRI or a mammogram at my cancer center when I can just go down the street and get at the testing clinic. If I had easy access to those records, if I had more control in how those recommendations got sent, then you know, I would be a proactive member of healthcare. I would be saving the medical system a lot of money and I would have more control over my care. But it, they make it so hard that you really just go to one place to get everything done. And if you can afford it, great. And if you can't, you've got to go to a place that doesn't have as good of a reputation, but that's more cost effective. And I think right there is a problem. I mean, you can't have patients self-selecting into better and worse treatment facilities based on their income, it just in their location. Already that's a problem. And so that's why I think that these groups have too much power. They, they siphon us off from our care too much so that we don't have control over our information and where we go. Well, the other thing you, you need to know that at least you know that the information is available. Some people don't even know those records are their records and they leave with you when you leave. And that's not a natural thing for somebody to just know. But the other thing is we as Black women aren't even uh, referred to different advantages that are due anyone, uh, such as getting your genetic testing. There shouldn't be any breast cancer survivor who has not had genetic testing just to rule out certain things. But if it's not offered and you're not educated, you won't know to ask for it. So as an organization, we add these things to the knowledge that we spread through our uh, weekly and uh, monthly uh, webinars and Zooms that explain the things that you need to know. Because if you don't hear it, you don't know. And they're very important for us to realize, even in clinical trials. Some of us want to be in a clinical trial, but if no one ever asks you, you don't even consider it. So they just write us off that we don't do clinical trials. That's not true. We're not aware. And when it hasn't been explained for us to know, it's a great advantage to do clinical trials. So there's a lot, a lot of work to be done. And on that note, unbelievably, we are out of time. I knew this 25 minutes together was going to fly by. Thank you both so much. This was a wonderful conversation. I learned so much from both of you, and I'm sure our audience will as well. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure to be part of this conversation. Such an important conversation about what it's like to live and fight through a cancer diagnosis, something so many families are all too familiar with. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our speakers and to all of you for joining us today. Thanks again to our sponsor Pfizer for making this event possible. And thanks to the thousands of 19th News members who support our nonprofit newsroom. Your donations make conversations like today's possible. If you're not a 19th News member yet, we'd love to have you join us at 19thnews.org slash membership. We look forward to welcoming you to the 19th family. And we'll see you next time.